The revival of long dead shows is a topic I've talked about a few times previously on this channel, and every time this topic comes up I get commenters who are against the idea of revivals, or at the very least wary of them because of bad experiences with other revived shows, projects which have come back on the air after years of downtime only to disappoint, and Young Justice is often cited as an example, a revived show whose new seasons don't live up to the glory days, and perhaps even tarnish the legacy of the initial run. And and to be blunt, I don't agree with this. Being wary of revivals is fine, but as someone who's watched the entirety of Young Justice's run in the past couple of months in an unbroken fashion, I think that if you're using this show as an example of a bad revival, one which came back years later, too different and too low quality, then you're wrong. And in this video, I'll explain why that is. Oh, and also, just quickly, if the audio sounds better today, it's because I dropped a fat pouch of ducats on a new mic, so if you want to help me try and recoup that cost, a like on this video will help it reach more people. But let's get back to the content. First, I'll make the most obvious point. There's a lot to like in Young Justice's third season. The overall narrative goes to some fascinating places, like the idea of an ideological fracture within the Justice League, driven by the increasingly immoral methods pursued by their opponents, even while publicly occupying positions of legitimacy. There was an eight-year gap between the airing of season two and season three, and I think it's fair to say that for a lot of people, the world looked like a darker and more corrupt place in 2019 than it did in 2011. The questions outsiders ask about how far we're prepared to go in service of a noble mission were vital then, and they're still vital now. And speaking of that subtitle, Outsiders, this season also provides a new, if loose, interpretation of that perhaps lesser-known DC team, bringing classic Outsiders members like Geoforce, Black Lightning, and Halo into the story. It's almost a smaller version of season one in that regard. While Young Justice's first batch of episodes introduced a Teen Titans-esque group with a few fresh twists, season three tells a new story but one which plays around with elements of the comic book Outsiders, albeit fairly loosely, but more on that later. This requires something of a balancing act between new characters and familiar faces, which we'll get back to, but again, there's a lot to like about the continuing journeys of the original team. Seeing Kelda as Aquaman, not Aqualad, is great. It makes you feel like a proud parent seeing their kid graduate. I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion, but I liked the scenes with McGann and Connor, and how they explored their relationship issues. It felt real, weirdly real, even for an emotionally intelligent show like Young Justice. Sometimes problems come up in a relationship, even if you both love each other totally. Those problems aren't normally solved by psychic powers, but this all felt genuine and mature. Throughout season three, Nightwing remains one of the show's absolute best characters, and I loved seeing him lead and coach a new wave of heroes. What I loved even more than this, however, was seeing Nightwing struggle with Batman's shadow over his soul. He's always been a character fighting to preserve his own humanity while getting the mission done, and Season 3 sees Dick slipping into Batman-esque manipulation on more than one occasion. We know that at his heart, this isn't who Nightwing wants to be, that he's always trying to lead and fight honestly, and it's a pleasure to see this dynamic play out, even when he fails. Not counting Zatanna and Rocket, who, yeah, it would have been nice to see some more of, that leaves just Art Artemis and Red Arrow of the main season one crew, and I really like the stuff they get given here too. There's a lot more to these characters in Outsiders than what I'm about to discuss, but one thing I thought was particularly interesting was the way this season's layout allows the viewer to move on from Wally West alongside Artemis. After the time skip, as we settle into the groove of the third season, we see Artemis is living with Will Harper, aka the Roy Harper clone, aka Red Arrow, and initially this feels a bit like a slap in the face. After all, from our perspective, the last the last thing we saw before season 3 was the tragic death of Artemis's partner Wally, who by that point we were also pretty fond of. It turns out that Artemis and Will are merely cohabiting and looking after Will and Cheshire's kid, so that initial sting fades away, but over the course of the season we see how much Artemis is still struggling in the wake of Wally's death, particularly in an absolutely heartbreaking scene towards the end of Outsiders. Artemis gives in just a little to her and Will's mutual attraction, they kiss, and she immediately breaks down. By this point, we've existed in a Wally-less world for a while, but we see, for instance, in the episode Terminus that these characters haven't forgotten about him, that Kid Flash will always be a part of them despite his sacrifice. We've begun to accept this loss. So seeing Artemis still stuck in that pain is tough. When this season's done, when she's finally made that step out of mourning, we're relieved for her. And in a direct inversion of our instinctive reactions at the start of the season, we're happy, albeit in a bittersweet way, that she's 
able to start opening her heart to other people. And speaking of the episode Terminus, I think that's a great example of the fact that there are some really standout individual episodes in this season, and that Young Justice retained the power to pull off surprising, unpredictable plots. Watching this episode, I completely expected the original team to win, and I was genuinely caught off guard when they didn't. All that being said, I'm not going to pretend that this was a perfect season of television. There's a lot of different storylines going on in Outsiders, and not all of these get enough time in focus. The Batman Incorporated stuff, the anti-light stuff, it feels fairly underdeveloped, especially when compared to all the time we get with characters like Brion, Halo, and Forager. But even the storyline focused on these latter characters could do with more time to breathe. Brion's heel turn in the finale, for instance, feels a touch sudden. So there's a lot of good stuff here, but maybe too much of it. To the the point where areas feel overstuffed. Especially given I've not even mentioned the story of the Outsider Squad proper, the one led by Beast Boy. But in fairness, there are worse problems you could have than having too much good stuff. So this pacing is a weakness perhaps, but not one severe enough to sink the season. There are strengths to the pacing too. By wrapping up the more dramatic arm of the overarching narrative, the whole dark side, granny goodness side of things, a few episodes before the season ends, the Earth-based stuff gets to breathe a little. The aforementioned Artemis story happens in the season's penultimate episode, Overwhelmed, and I for one am glad the season made narrative space for this story, instead of dragging out the space stuff any longer. And even if parts of the finale do feel a little rushed, it serves as a powerful resolution to some of the ideas this season's had regarding the friction between getting things done right and getting things done at all. The imbalances we see between power and morality were, again, especially relevant by 2019. And I know some people didn't like how overtly this conclusion reflected our real world, what with the fake news and the good people on both sides, but frankly, this stuff fits Lex Luthor. If you've got an issue with this, I'd suggest you take it up with the real-life ex-world leader who gave us these cartoonishly evil quotes, not with the cartoon which riffs on them. So that's my general take on why Outsiders is good, but the title of this video isn't why I think Outsiders is good, it's why you're wrong about Outsiders. So in this next section, I want to talk about the main reason I see being cited as to why this revival didn't work, and that's the failed balancing act between characters new and old. I'll grant this is a valid response. There's a lot of characters in Outsiders, and with the show's habit of introducing so many new faces each season, getting the balance right was always going to be a tricky task. While we get a fair bit of, say, Nightwing and Superboy, most of the characters that we came to know and love in the fan-favorite first season don't get enough time to have big, fully realized arcs. And that's just the class of season one. Heroes who played fairly big roles during Invasion are barely present, like Mal, Bumble, be or Blue Beetle. That's a bit of a bummer. And if you've spent years waiting for these characters to return, and then you don't even end up seeing that much of them, it's reasonable to feel shortchanged. But here's the thing, this didn't start with season 3. If this is a problem, it's not a problem with Outsiders. It's an issue from the show's original run that simply continued. There's a lot of characters on Young Justice, so I don't really want to count them all up and see which season introduces the most, but I'm willing to bet we get more new faces in 2 than 3. And even if I'm wrong, I wouldn't be wrong by much and the lack of focus on the original team was in full force during Invasion. With Wally out of the game for much of the story, Zatanna popping up once or twice, Rocket almost nowhere to be seen, and Aqualad absent initially, then undercover, then bedridden. Maybe we see the OG squad interact more here than we do in Outsiders, but it's clear to me that the width of Season 3, the balancing act between new characters and old, is merely the continuation of a trend which started pre-cancellation. I watched Seasons 1, 2, 3, and 4 back to back, and to be honest, the skip from season 1 to 2 was the most jarring of them all. So without blowing my own trumpet too hard, I think this is an area where I can offer a semi-unique perspective. Since so much of the discourse around Young Justice is framed around the perspectives of longtime fans, fans who watched the first two seasons a decade ago and had to endure the long wait for a revival. That isn't me. I watched the whole thing, seasons 1 to 4 this year, in a pretty much unbroken sequence, and when you approach the text on its own terms, without a big nostalgia generating idealizing gap in the middle, and without the weight of years worth of fan expectations and theories building up, there really doesn't seem to be a big shift in quality or focus or trajectory between seasons 2 and 3 in the way that these dominant fan narratives tend to suppose. When you watch the show like I did without the weight, other criticisms of Outsiders fall away too. For instance, Polygon's review of the season back in 2019 includes the following paragraph. Multiple episodes focused on characters whose names I couldn't even remember because I forgot which episode
episode they'd last appeared in. The subplot of one involved Karen Beecher giving birth to her first child. It's supposed to be a heart-wrenching moment, as Karen makes the difficult choice to alter her baby's genetics and give them the metagene. But the entire time I kept trying to remember who her husband was and why this was such an issue in their relationship. Now, I'm not trying to bash this review. It's a pretty solid review, and from what I can tell, it really captures the general spirit of the way this new season was received by the long-term fans at its release. But I feel complaints like this are due more to the gap between seasons than anything in the seasons themselves. But to fully get into what I mean here, we need to talk briefly about the ways that opinions and narratives are constructed in fan spaces. With long-running franchises, shows and media properties more widely, the viewpoints of older fans tend to become privileged over those of new ones. This isn't some sinister conspiracy though, it's just kinda how these things go. The Young Justice fan community, for instance, was born when groups of people enjoying the first seasons came together to discuss the show. Over years of discussion, reminiscing, debating, theorizing, shared conclusions would have been drawn. Some episodes would have emerged as general favorites. Some characters would similarly have been established as fan favorites. Whenever a new viewer would find their way into one of these discussion spaces, then any opinions they personally had would have been measured up against these established general conclusions. Any points of agreement would further strengthen the convictions of the fanbase, and any points of divergence, well, the new fan has two choices. Either they share their own differing opinions and face the uphill battle of trying to convince a big portion of the fanbase that their novel viewpoint is a legitimate one, or maybe the new fan thinks, hang on, these people know what they're talking about, they've been watching the show for longer, they've rewatched it a bunch, maybe I am wrong. Either way, the established consensus generally perseveres. Dominant fan narratives remain dominant and new fans largely either get on board or get drowned out. Again, there's nothing sinister here, it's kind of just the way things work. And I'm not for one second saying the Young Justice fanbase is some echo chamber. No, it's actually a really pleasant fanbase, one which is by and large free from toxicity and elitism, but the pattern described above applies here nonetheless, and that privileging of older fans' viewpoints is intensified a thousandfold when a show takes an extended hiatus like Young Justice did. It's only natural that the fans who waited years and years would react to this third season differently to those viewers who jumped on board with the release of these new episodes. The huge break, the expectations and the theories which blossomed and spread wildly in the hiatus years, and possibly a romanticizing retrospective lens for seasons 1 and 2, are all metatextual factors which absolutely would have altered the way Outsiders was received. As a result, oftentimes there's a disconnect between the viewing experiences of new fans, fans who watched 1, 2, and 3 back to back without the break, and the way the same episodes are viewed by the old guard. I think the best example of this is the Wally stuff. I tried to abstain from checking out forums, subreddits, twitter spaces dedicated to Young Justice until I'd caught up with the show midway through Phantoms. But when I did finally dive into these places of discussion, I found that quite a lot of the show was widely interpreted in ways quite different to how I'd understood it. Moments like Beast Boy's Monkey God Vision scene, or Nightwing's concussed vision in Terminus, or Artemis' fake spell life in Overwhelmed seemed to be universally viewed as teasing, baiting on the show's part, hinting at some impending resurrection of Kid Flash. That isn't at all what these moments were to me. They were just moments which spoke, each in their own way, to the major presence Wally had had to these people. Moments where we catch a glimpse of the deep connection these people had. Having seen this for myself in the first two seasons, it felt only natural that this connection wouldn't simply vanish with Wally's death. But after Outsiders dropped, when new fans came into the subreddit or a discord, or start following accounts on Twitter discussing the show, the posts they saw were from the older fans who had in part filtered the text through these pre-established expectations, opinions, theories, and so forth. And so the process we talked about a minute ago means that even now, the fan reception of Outsiders is heavily influenced by the hiatus, at times almost more so than it's influenced by the episodes we did end up getting. As someone who watched this season without engaging much in this fan discourse, though, I think there are some serious discrepancies between the criticisms I've seen of it and the text that's being criticised. At the end of the day, season 3 is different to 2 and 1, both in positive ways like the willingness to dive into darker topics, and in less positive ways like potentially bumpy pacing and shaky character balancing. But these seasons are all different, and that was true before Young Justice ever got revived or cancelled. Moreover, Outsiders' focus on newer characters, its ensemble cast, and its multipolar storytelling are not big left turns. When you actually look back at the first two seasons, and the steps Invasion took, without yet nostalgia goggles equipped. 
So if that's your issue with outsiders, then I'm sorry, but I think you're wrong. Of course, that's not the only common criticism of outsiders you tend to see. The other major one is, and say it with me, that it's bad because Young Justice got woke. Is this true? Well, n no, no it isn't. This is a wider issue some people have with the show going beyond just outsiders, so as such I'm not going to spend much time on it here. I think I'll probably end up making a video specifically on this critique, if you can even call it a critique, but we should probably talk about it briefly. The first difficulty in defending something from the charge of bad cause woke is defining woke, because as a term used in this context it really has no fixed meaning other than thing which I don't like. When used in discussions around Young Justice Outsiders though, accusations of wokeness tend to be directed towards the character of Halo. We find out a little later that both Halo's gender identity and religious identity are more complex than they appear at first glance, but in Outsiders at least Halo appears to be a Muslim coded girl. And obviously having all the white characters in the world is fine and dandy, but one female Arabic superhero is forced diversity. Gee, where have I heard that one before? Except this isn't forced diversity. Let me explain. Side note, before I do explain, forced diversity is pretty much never a valid criticism. It pretty much never even makes sense and is almost exclusively used as a dog whistle for racists and bigots. The fact that I'm arguing against it here isn't to suggest that it's ever really a valid concept, it's just so I can clearly spell out how it's nonsense in this specific case. So. As we discussed earlier, Young Justice Outsiders is very loosely adapting the DC team of the same name. The whole Markovia storyline, with Jace and the Markovs, is heavily inspired by the comic book team's origin story, and that's also why we see Batman working with Katana and Metamorpho in Season 3. They're all members of that initial squad. Soon afterwards, the Outsiders come into contact with a hero named Halo, an extraterrestrial energy being who entered the dead body of a Violet Harper. Sounds familiar, right? Well, the major difference is that this Halo is pretty white. But this new version being not white isn't evidence of some woke conspiracy. Instead, it's a change which makes a lot of sense, a change which is actually kinda necessary. Because this season isn't just loosely adapting the Outsiders' origin, it's also telling its own story, a continuation of the grand narrative that season 1 and 2 started. And this chapter's all about a meta-human trafficking epidemic, one fueled by manufactured geopolitical instability, particularly in the region surrounding the fictional country of Karak, which is largely an allegorical reflection of countries like Syria and Libya, which had been involved in broadly similar real-world conflicts in the years leading up to Outsiders. That's not woke politics politicking for the sake of it, that's just using the aesthetics of the real to sort of speed run the characterization of this fictional place, as a shortcut to clearly communicate to the audience the general vibe of what's going on and how we should understand these people and their plight. But telling this story of the American League and team intervening against shadowy traffickers against the background of a war-torn Middle Eastern state could well have been a little dicey if the setting had been used as nothing more than a backdrop, a plot device. So in a lot of ways it makes sense that the writers would want to bring in a character from this setting. It also allows this thematic exploration, the way the show takes on issues like immigration, trafficking and the civilian cost, to happen organically. Since we have a major character who is directly affected by these issues, the sort of issues which more often than not just get glossed over in the background of media like this. But there's not really any comic book characters which would fit, and certainly none tied to the outsiders. Realistically Young Justice had two choices introduce a wholly original character, or alter an existing outsider. It's no surprise to me that they picked the latter option. It contributes to the adaptive nature of the season as a whole, it allows the trafficking storyline to tie nearly seamlessly into the cosmic stuff, and just imagine if they introduced a Middle Eastern female OC with no basis in the comics whatsoever. Imagine the tidal wave of salt and backlash that would have poured over this show from online chuds. No, the choice was clear, especially since comics Halo isn't exactly a major player. This choice also makes sense for other reasons. For instance, now all the outsider adjacent Harpers are connected, and their coincidentally shared surname provides the material for a solid character beat. You can use Harper if you want. Violet Harper. I like it. Okay then. Violet Harper. It is very nice to meet you. So, forced diversity is not an idea with much merit to it at the best of times, but I hope you can see that even if it were, it wouldn't apply here. 
Side note number two, the more valid critiques of Halo are from viewers concerned about the way their quasi-religious status is coded and represented in the show. For instance, there's an interesting article I read about the way Halo's various bloody injuries and deaths play into harmful tropes that exist around the on-screen depiction of Middle Eastern women. I started this script months ago though, and as of early July, I can't seem to find this article anywhere. If anyone watching recognizes what I'm talking about, I'd really appreciate some help finding it in the comments. And if we do find it, I'll add a link to the description. More widely, I think a lot of people weren't thrilled about the dubious ways this character's story interacts with the ethno-religious background of Gabrielle Dow. A lot of voices I've seen online seem to be a little happier with these aspects of Halo in Season 4 though, so hopefully things are moving in the right direction. And while I understand the dissatisfaction with Halo's deaths and injuries, the way they perhaps unintentionally echo the violence and mutilation common in media depictions of Middle Eastern women, I do wonder if there's some suka in the fact that this character defies this pain and violence. They always heal. That feels like a well-intentioned gesture. An attempt at writing against or subverting this trope. Maybe it doesn't work, maybe it's tone deaf, but I do think there's some nuance here. Side note over, returning to wokeness. Maybe the little piss babies crying woke didn't just mean Halo specifically, maybe they meant the general focus on more mature, quote unquote political stuff, like the refugee slash trafficking plot, but that's just as dumb. The existence of refugees isn't some leftist conspiracy, they just exist in the world. Young Justice had always considered things like politics and capital when telling its stories and building its world since season one, and an increasing awareness of these aspects in Outsiders isn't the show getting woke. This is the show maturing, and if that makes you uncomfortable then maybe the show's just more mature than you are. So that's why some of these common criticisms of Outsiders kinda don't hold up to me. If you've got an issue with it which I didn't touch on here, feel free to leave it in the comments. And let me know if you want to see a specific dedicated video going deeper on the whole woke thing. The next Young Justice video will be on phantoms though, and the anti-fascist layer of that season's themes that you might have missed. So come back for that in like, maybe a month-ish? Thanks for watching though, and a special thanks to all my patrons on screen now, especially Kevin Douglas.